Welcome, welcome everybody uh, near and far. Welcome to our virtual extravaganza that is the second academic debate of the Arcus Alliance. My name is Steve Robich and I'm a postdoctoral researcher with the Center for Inter-American Studies at the University of Graz, where I primarily work in American cultural studies and cultural history, which of course also includes quite a bit of political history and political culture. It is my pleasure to serve as uh, both your host and moderator today. A few introductory uh, notes on the ARCUS network and our debate format of today's event. Uh, what, or rather, who is ARCUS? Uh, the ARCUS European University Alliance is a formal partnership that brings together seven prestigious research uh, universities who share the conviction that European cooperation is essential for our collective global future. These are the universities of Bergen in Norway, Granada in Spain, Graz here in Austria, Leipzig in Germany, Lyon in France, Padua in Italy, and last but not least, Vilnius in Lithuania. So what do we have in store for uh, all of you today? Uh, this format of the Arcus Debates was inaugurated this summer to showcase the scientific and scholarly expertise that the seven Arcus universities have to offer. And uh, the format is scheduled to take place on a more or less regular basis at regular intervals, anywhere between six to eight weeks. And the topics of the debates revolve around issues that are of great significance here in Europe, indeed, actually around the globe. As, of the, as is the case with our panel today, the Arcus uh, debates bring together researchers and scholars uh, from the different universities in a live online science to public forum, which aims at addressing the general public and answer their questions. An event like ours today is made possible by different institutions, communities uh, coming together in pursuit of a shared goal to promote public outreach, public education, and international dialogue. And on behalf of the University of Graz, I would like to thank our trusted partners uh, in the Arcus Alliance. And on behalf of my panel, uh, panelists and myself, I would also like to express our gratitude to Arcus comms man, uh, officer Marina Fernandez Peña Mola, who's based in Granada, and also Gerhard Yeliak, my colleague here at Graz. They are the busy bees behind the scenes, making sure that everything runs smoothly. One last bit of housekeeping for our online audiences. Uh, we encourage y'all to direct questions and comments to us who are on the panel. Please use the chat function uh, on YouTube to deposit uh, your questions, and we'll try to weave as many of them uh, as possible into our ongoing conversation. And we'll start taking questions right after our opening round so that we can have a bit of, uh, more of a conversation with you all out there. So the stage is set for the 2020 U.S. presidential elections. Uh, we're all waiting for next Tuesday to arrive. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, as well as continuous calls for social justice by the Black Lives Matter movement, have made the 2020 race particularly challenging. Fortunately, uh, I'm joined by these four wonderful speakers today who will help us grapple with the workings of the U.S. presidential elections, their significance for us here who live in Europe, and provide a little bit of an outlook on the time after the elections, regardless of who emerges as the winner. Before we get started with the actual debate, uh, I will hand over the virtual floor now to our four individual speakers uh, who will each take their turn to briefly introduce themselves. Please tell the audience out there in the World Wide Web who you are, where you hail from, and what you do in your research. And I would like to ask Dunya to, to kick us off. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Steve, for starting this uh, this event and debate. I'm sure that it will be very profitable. Uh, you said it all, so I think I'll just get uh, straight into it. Um, so my name is Zinia Mansawi. I am a teacher of English and a teacher of business English. Um, I'm also a researcher in the fields of media studies and discourse analysis, but more specifically political discourse analysis. Uh, my research actually revolves around the uh, evolution of the American political discourse and its impact, or rather reflection, on the concepts of liberalism and identity. So, but today I'm going to focus more in my talk, or while we uh, started this debate, on, the, uh, on Trump's uh, discourse. So we'll tr I'll try just to unveil the ideologies, uh, the mindset, and the implications in his discourse during the, his debate, his talks, and his speeches. Um, so yeah, that's about it. So stick around. I'm sure that we'll all learn uh, a lot today. So thank you. Thank you, Dunia. Uh, Hans. All right, Steve. Thank you. Um, hello from Norway. I'm very happy to take part in this uh, uh, debate. Uh, I'm Hans uh, Gosmer. I'm at the University of Bergen. Also have a position at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, and I specialize on Chinese 
politics, uh, following how those political, social, and economic political uh, developments move forward and how China's own domestic capacities translate into its international involvement, particularly in a set of international organizations and when it comes to economic interaction. And when that comes to the high income world, that's mostly about investments and trade, whilst in the developing world, that's of course a lot more about other types of investments and aid. Uh, and of course, uh, seen from a Chinese uh, perspective, the uh, U.S. election has possibly never been uh, more important, and I'm uh, sure we'll discuss that in many more ways. Um, so happy to join. Thank you so much, Hans. Sebastian? Hi. Uh, I'm Sebastian Herman. I'm also glad to be here, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, I'm... Uh, an assistant professor at American Studies Leipzig in Germany. Um, my primary interests are in the politics of different kinds of form. Um, and uh, I've been working on, and that's probably the, the closest tie to our conversation today, I've been working a lot on the notion of unreality in the American presidency and in American politics. Um, so that is one of those areas where I was interested in, in the politics of form. Um, and right now I'm interested, among other things, in, in the contemporary forms of populism, of course. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to, to finally having this conversation with you. Cool. Thanks so much uh, to, uh, to uh, that you join us. And last but certainly not least, Linus. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm Linus Koyala. I'm uh, in Vilnius, Lithuania. I'm teaching at uh, Vilnius University, American Foreign Policy. I'm also heading a think tank here based in Vilnius Eastern Europe Studies Center and work as an associate expert at Foreign Policy Research Institute in the United States, as well as an associate at Negotiation Task Force at Davis Center at Harvard University. So my focus prim is primarily on U.S. foreign policy and its development, especially with regards to Europe uh, and on security matters. So hopefully we'll touch upon U.S. international role in our today's discussion. Thanks again for having me. Wonderful. Thank you all for uh, wonderful introductions here. And as, you, uh, as everybody out there can already see, we have assembled a, a group of very bright minds of a lot of brain power. So how about we just uh, jump right into the fray? Uh, I would actually like us to begin by way of uh, establishing a little, bit, a little bit of a level playing field for exchange in the next 50 minutes or so and using one of Trump's, uh, President Trump's catchphrases that is America first. And I would like each and every one of you to briefly speak to what could be labeled the Trump doctrine, if there even is such a thing. So in other words, uh, President Trump's first term, as we all know, is drawing to a close. It appears as if many things have changed or are different now than they were in 2016, or perhaps they're not that different after all. And just for the moment for the opening round, I would like us to bracket out, if possible, bracket, uh, bracket out the COVID-19 pandemic. So my question to you all is, and uh, viewed from our European vantage point and coming from your own uh, different disciplines and uh, your own different backgrounds, where do you think that the current administration has had its most pronounced impacts, both domestically, but perhaps more importantly here in Europe? And how and why should these impacts matter? So if you could give us a little bit of a, uh, a thought on that by way of an open ground, whoever wants to go first. Uh. I think uh, I'll just go uh, straight to the what you said, uh, Trump's doctrine. And I think that the conceptual name that would best fit what could be called the Trump doctrine is conservative nationalism. I don't think the others really uh, agree with me or not. But I think that maybe the word doctrine may seem too formal, but um, there it is undeniable that Trump has a set of beliefs and mindset uh, that tend towards an inward looking brand of unilateralism, I believe. Um, and such ideas were advanced uh, by the American First Committee during the run-up to the Second World War. Um, and such beliefs maybe can include America First, as you mentioned, American national identity, highly selective involvement, and that is uh, defining America's role maybe vis-a-vis uh, -vis itself, vis-a-vis -vis the world, vis-a-vis -vis Europe especially, and the emphasis on America's strength in all its form. So, you know, if you listen to all uh, to the, uh, Trump's debate, I think you can just say, you know, I want to do something special with you, with everybody, because everybody wants to make America great again and so on. 
Um, and I think, uh, well, from the perspective of the field that I'm expert in, I think it can be interpreted that the ideology uh, that is used by Trump is gaining power. I mean, power signs and manifestations in every aspect of social life. From It can go from interpersonal relations through economic transactions, spiritual, political disagreements. Um, power to control, I think, is the first key that is used by Trump in making America great again. Um, he uses this idea, I think, to gain power to make America become superpower that can control many aspects in the world, including Europe. So I think Trump doctrine is based on nationalism against globalism, or, you know, you can call it imperialism if you're talking about a current time. You know, he always says, I'm a nationalist, okay, I'm a nationalist. So, you know, he puts this a balkanization, I would say, nationalism as opposed to liberalism and globalism, um, because liberalism represents claims, rights, uh, responsibilities that really overcome and transcend those national liberal ideas. Um, well, you know, it's really debatable to choose which one, but it is sufficient to say that Trump administration is really defining um, a nation in a very ethnic, religious manner, I would say, against liberal values. So his rhetoric and policies um, have legitimized the, politi uh, the politics of ethnic nationalism and his foreign policies uh, has followed suit. And I think we'll go over that uh, later on. So if I am to summarize uh, Trump's doctrine in one statement, then I would say conservative nationalism based on power to guarantee um, America first, I think. I don't know what the others would be thinking of that. Thank you for such a wonderful opening. Yeah, how, how, Sebastian, I think, is ready to jump right in. Maybe I can just piggyback on that a little bit. Um, I very much agree, and I, I was very happy that you, you put it that way, that doctrine might be a bit of a complicated or, or, or too big of a concept for something that is much more fragmented and much more um, ad hoc than the notion of a doctrine would seem to suggest. Um, I would perhaps add to your emphasis on power, I would add another aspect that I think is central and that has to do with the role of conflict um, as, as in a way a basic formal principle of, of political action, um, conflict that at times is even more important than the outcome and that can be both serious conflict or just uh, symbolic conflict or playful conflict, different forms of conflict, I think. And I think that's also captured in this notion of America first, because in a way, uh, America first doesn't really say anything new about foreign policy or about US foreign policy. It just says the quiet part loud. It expresses um, an aspect that has been guiding American foreign policy for decades, but it, it phrases it in the language of conflict. It phrases it, it in a way that makes it hard for other people at first glance to, to agree because it's, it's this, this sense of open supremacy um, that is being transported. Um, and then maybe also ex ex expanding on what Dunya said, I think there's this weird moment where this foregrounding of conflict then becomes curiously a point of agreement between this form of nationalism and other forms of nationalist uh, endeavors. So you have, you have other nationalists, German nationalists, French nationalists who should balk at the notion of America first, really just recognizing the formal pattern of conflict in this and agreeing with that formal pattern um, and sort of understanding this, this international lingua franca of populism um, as being built around conflict. Um, so that's, I think, what I would add to this, to this wonderful opening um, and say it's, it's, it's power, but it's certainly also conflict and open conflict, conflict as a spectacle that is put front and center and that does work regardless of the outcome. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, now we've basically heard two voices from a more or less a humanities background. How about the, the political scientists and the security specialists? What, uh, what are your responses to that question? Should I go or should we wait for uh, Linus to have his take? Sure. 
Uh, yeah, so I can maybe add up uh, the aspect of unilateralism. I don't think that the Trump's administration's policies were isolationist, as we probably some at least expected it to be uh, before he was elected. Uh, it was more based on trade-offs uh, and bilateral relations with different countries. So in Europe, that meant different things. For instance, with Poland, it seems that the U.S. policies and the relationship have increased for the better, and they have a lot of new projects going on, uh, including stationing more American troops in Poland, some of them coming from other European countries. Uh, they have also close cooperation on energy projects. Their ideas and interests seem to be aligned on uh, such uh, areas as energy, including Nord Stream 2. Uh, but with other countries, that same bilateral relationship is not as as good as with Poland. Uh, and the obvious example is probably Germany, uh, with which uh, the relationship uh, deteriorated on multiple fronts, uh, starting from trust as such, and uh, going down to uh, some important strategic decisions, including uh, 12,000 American troops who should leave the country, at least according to Trump's administration decision. We'll see whether that's being pursued to the end because Trump administ Trump's administration was never strong on policy implementation. It was always loud in making statements and um, pushing others to think that something is really happening, but not necessarily pursuing uh, the practical implementation of the things that were said or published on, on Twitter. So we'll see how that goes on. But then you can see again, this kind of bilateral uh, trend in, and trade-off based uh, trend in US foreign policy, which leaves somewhat leaves uh, policies such as alliances, uh, organizations of multinational cooperation uh, aside. It pushes them aside. It makes them less important than before. And it obviously weakens the long-term uh, scenarios for European and American cooperation because uh, obviously if it's based on trade-offs and bilaterals, uh, then the uh, whole concept of transatlantic relationship seems to be going down. All right, so maybe I can jump in. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on US-American uh, politics. I, I study Chinese politics uh, as, a, as a European, and I think as a kind of a European to start off international politics observer or researcher, um, I think uh, I would frame the, the so-called Trump doctrine or the um, doctrine of the, the America first as a kind of more uh, pronounced set of self-interests that are a bit more or a very much kind of narrow, narrower defined than we are used to, but it's also a lot of uncertainty in types of what issues are pushed at different times. And I think it's also a matter of who uh, amongst, whether it's Trump himself or, or who his most closest associates around him are also in those key positions as the foreign ministry and security officials and, and, um, and in charge of defense. So the kind of the content of the doctrine or the, the issues that are pushed, I think we have also seen vary a bit. And that also, of course, is informed by my take on Chinese politics and how Chinese diplomats and, and leaders and, and uh, scholars look to the US. And I think that has also changed significantly, significantly over the last four years, uh, where we have moved from a stage during the, the election four years ago in the initial years, where you could see very vocal and very strong type of vocal expressions against uh, China, uh, but with relatively little content when it comes to issues being pushed. And of course, in the last couple of years, that has changed drastically uh, with a very strong push on issues that are seen as, um, as uh, of course, uh, pushing forward with, with uh, American interests justified by various types of um, justifications, uh, but again, framed around uh, issues uh, that serves U.S. interests uh, in a competition towards uh, uh, a rising or emerging or increasingly powerful uh, China. And I think that's where we are also today, where uh, seen from the Chinese perspective, at least, it's, uh, it's a set of uh, policies or issues that, uh, that are pushed to serve 
a set of narrowly defined interests. Uh, but of course, I think from the Chinese perspective, it's a very, very strong awareness also of, of uh, the kind of overall American change when it comes to its uh, policy positions in both parties towards China and some other actors. And there are also certainly issues uh, that are not pushed by Trump uh, that uh, Chinese leaders are also prepared to, to see uh, increased contention around if the presidency was to change to a, a democratic president. Well, thank you so much for those different voices uh, and 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 statements in response to this opening question. Uh, I immediately had to latch on to a couple of things before we uh, talk a little bit about follow up. I wanted to remind our audiences again to have those questions or comments ready uh, because there is a bit of a time lag anyway. So uh, bef uh, until we get some questions from our audience members. I noticed that, so between we, we had, uh, Dunya mentioned uh, nationalism, Linus also highlighted unilateralism, and also there's a lot of noise, uh, if I gather you all right, uh, when it comes to the Trump administration, uh, not necessarily a lot of follow-up, right, um, or specific policies or specific uh, issues that are being pushed. Now, that kind of fits in a little bit with this often stated goal of the Trump administration uh, to reduce American commitments and res responsibilities abroad. And uh, I'd like to us to refocus again, because Lena's already highlighted a couple of uh, one or two examples uh, based in Europe. Can you perhaps talk about a few specific examples where we can see or feel this, these effects of the United States' alleged goal to reduce its international commitments here in Europe. I mean, is there any, I mean, you mentioned Poland. In Poland, you actually have the opposite, uh, more or less, in a nutshell. Perhaps a couple of other um, thoughts along those lines. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, I think, first of all, the U.S. retreats from many international organizations, which leads to it's a rather shallow involvement on climate change matters, for instance, with Paris Climate Change Agreement. Uh, in terms of trade, we see a lot of discussions on World Trade Organization, and while it does not necessarily mean you know, some concrete decisions at this point, in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term, that means that the U.S. is less uh, committed to multiple challenges that the European countries face. But again, I, I would like to em emphasize this difference between the talk and the action, because probably quite a lot of people in Central and Eastern Europe would argue that Trump's administration was not as bad as a lot of people predicted it to be, uh, because uh, some of the commitments even increased. And we can also talk about commitments not only to the NATO allies, but to countries uh, rather closer to Russia such as Ukraine, uh, which, for instance, received lethal weaponry uh, from Trump's administration, while uh, the previous administration was rather hesitant on making that decision, even though Joe Biden, who was then obviously the vice president, was supportive of, of this action. And we have to take into account the differences in timing. Uh, the war was uh, much more intensive uh, at that time, so maybe it was more risky, but still, the decision was made. Also, the sanctions on Russia uh, which is another matter that was highly emphasized during the campaign and after Trump was elected, uh, they were increased, which is, again, probably, well, the policies that uh, many countries in the region close to Russia would expect the U.S. to pursue. And this points to one other aspect, and that's probably the last point that I want to make in this, in this short uh, um, statement, is that we have to take into account more than the US president. We usually follow the president, the, the, the White House, uh, whatever tweet is there and et cetera, but US is much more than that. And uh, the Senate and the House of Representatives play an essential role. And in many cases, decisions made in the Congress were the focus of many international policies, especially on Europe, uh, from the U.S. in the most recent years, including the sanctions, which was which was uh, pushed by by the Congress more than the president himself, including Nord Stream 2, which was again uh, a focus on the Congress and not necessarily by Trump's administration, at least on on policy matters, not uh, Twitter matters. Uh, so, especially now with the Congress elections also taking place, uh, third of the Senate is being elected at the same time as the president and the whole. A group of House of Representatives. So we have to take that into account and uh, not over focus on one person. He's really important, whether that's Trump or Biden, but that's not only it. 
Thank you for this wonderful reminder. I was just talking about this to my students in my class. You know, the president is important, as you said, but there's much more to it than just this one man. Sebastian, you wanted to, to follow up on that. Right, thank you for, for emphasizing this. Um, I, I also think it's really, really important to, to remember, to broaden the view. And I, would, I think I would like to broaden it even more um, beyond the realm of like hard politics maybe, because I think, oh, if there's one thing we can take away from the history of public diplomacy is that usually what gets received is not necessarily what is being sent. Um, and I think that's true even more broadly in, in international relations frequently. And so to push maybe a little bit of, a, of another counterintuitive point, I feel that um, paradoxically, the, um, the kind of isolationalism we've seen um, as a a pronounced public uh, political agenda has been um, followed up on, on other levels of, of uh, civic exchange um, by a, a remarkable increase in, in uh, exchange between at least the US and Europe. I feel that um, the political questions um, are moving through culture in much more synchronous ways than they used to do. Um, even 10 years back maybe. So I think that's that's an interesting development that we have political movements, political resistance to isolationalism, et cetera, um, spread through our societies on both sides of the Atlantic in, in these very similar ways with the same symbols, the same slogans even. Um, and I think it's, it's just interesting to think about um, whether some of this, this concern about isolationalism that we're seeing um, is perhaps because it is happening on both sides of the of the Atlantic, is in a way also um, a form of closeness um, on, on the level of civic society more than on the level of politics. Um, a colleague handed me the study by the German Marshall Fund um, that was done recently about the pre-pandemic and the post-pandemic view on on different different uh, political issues, and I was just struck by how, for example, the role that uh, is being generally attributed to China, whether China is the most important or the second most important or third most important country um, in the US and in Germany, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, it moved by the exact same numbers. So in both countries, um, eight, an eight percentile part of the population now tends to think, larger part tends to think that China is the most important international power. And I was just struck by that synchronicity, how in these two countries, this shift in opinion, I mean, it's of course just a statistical artifact, but I think it also tells us something about, about the closeness between these societies. Since you already had China in there and we do have a China expert, uh, Hans, any, any thoughts on that? Particularly on that, that closeness or that shift also in terms of perception? Right, well, there are so many good issues to jump on now, but I'll take take that as a starting point. I think, uh, again, in a European perspective, this plays out, I think, a little bit differently in different parts of the world where the dimension of, of China's size and volume and interaction is different. Uh, so I think the realization uh, in Europe, and particularly some corners of Europe, to the depth and the kind of volume and importance of China's growth that has been very gradual over 30, 40 years has come rather sudden. Uh, so it's only in these last five, 10 years that, that you see on every level of politics and in our administration and within Europe, European diplomacy is a sudden awakening of realities. And of course, when it comes to numbers and when it comes to economic clout in the world, uh, China is moving closer and closer uh, to the US position. And in many parts of the world, China is much bigger in terms of its economic presence and its uh, physical presence in terms of the actors who are there. Of course, when it comes to Europe, that situation is, is uh, different. There's a lot of trade uh, and there's a lot of um, some types of interactions, but of course the, the reliance and the connection towards the US is much, 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 much stronger uh, than they are towards uh, China. But when it comes to world politics and in other parts of the world, the reality is of course that in many parts of the world, China 
matters more to a lot of these countries than the US uh, uh, does. Um, but I think from um, a kind of a main takeaway from what has happened um, during the last uh, few years, and I would say starting before Trump, and that uh, again speaks back to my kind of life as a European, but also as a China uh, scholar, is a very certainty now uh, uh, kind of installed uh, vision. Although I agree with uh, uh, some of our colleagues here who, who point to the difference between the president and other US institutions, uh, I think it's a clear realization that the steady path that the US has uh, been on for the last few decades, uh, the kind of direction of that moving forward is no longer, doesn't seem as certain as, as it used to be. And that definitely also comes to how China looks at this election. Should there be a, a continuation of Trump or should there be a change to a new type of president? Uh, they're already prepared for a future uh, that will be a lot more conflictual and where uh, China will um, uh, prepare to be uh, a lot less dependent on the types of US supply. So the US reliant uh, value chains that it is uh, today. So uh, I would argue it is a very big and significant change with Trump or a realization that comes with Trump and, and kind of started before him uh, that we should also not kind of downplay, although the US Congress and other US institutions, of course, uh, also balance out the, the kind of um, um, extremeness of some of the, some of the uh, Trump either tweets or even policy positions. Thank you, Hans. I was going to uh, draw on uh, Dunia here, but you already wanted to say something because I had a bit of a question for you too, vis-a-vis -vis yeah. those other questions, but please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say that, um, I mean, like they said that, you know, the uh, the U.S. is not, go the world is not going to be uh, the same again, especially with the whole coronavirus. And I would like to dwell on that a bit. I mean, um, Trump blamed Europe for increasing the U.S. infections as he refers to COVID-19 as a horrible disease and so on. I mean, even if he said that, you know, while previous measures have low restrictions from China, the announcement of public health emergency, the warnings and so on, had led to a dramatic increase in U.S. infections. But he said that the problem lay with Europe. Um, and even in the start of his uh, presidency, he always regarded Europe as an afterthought. And there is a scholar who said that the relationship between uh, the European Union and U.S. is a bitter aftertaste right now. And I really agree with that. I mean, even if the State Department said that they have been goal saying it, that the United States and the transatlantic allies and partners uh, share the, the, those ideas and best practices uh, in responding to the unique complex challenges presented by the global pandemic and plan maybe for safety reopening the economy, the commerce and so on. But there are other officials that really say that the relationship between Europe and the US has not been so good lately. Um, especially when Trump announced the travel ban on March uh, with no, no notice, no consultation. Uh, so that really, that move really unleashed chaos, uh, European airports and so on. And it really contributed to the spread of coronavirus, I, I believe, because people would have been, you know, stranded overseas. So a lot of people maybe had, were infected with COVID-19, boarded planes and certain queues and so on. Um, so we can say that I think Trump uh, gradual dismantling of multilateralism, as Ines said, has acceler accelerated. And I think the solution is that Europe should be prepared. I mean, even, even if a Democrat did win, the damage done by Trump would not necessarily be undone. It's not something to be done um, overnight. Uh, populism will affect the U.S. policies for years to come. And even if a liberal democratic president would be worried and they're uh, doing Trump's policies on trade and immigration with withdrawal of military commitments and so on, uh, maybe that would fuel a next Donald Trump. Well, you never know, right? Um, so it really gradually must forge independence from the US uh, in defense and maybe starting with procurement. And uh, so, yeah, I think. Uh, Thank you for that response. I think Lena's already uh, wanted to immediately respond to that. Yeah, thank you. I very much agree with what was said uh, by Dunia and, and Hans. And I think we should not overlook the tendencies that go beyond Trump's administration in US policies. And one of the examples could be trade. Of course, in 2016, we have been in a situation where it still seems that transatlantic trade and investment partnership agreement 
could be plausible in the foreseeable future. Of course, the negotiations collapsed between the EU and the United States, and it now seems to be a very different world in terms of trade. And even if Trump is not reelected, it's not necessarily the case that Joe Biden will be very different on some of the trade matters, especially with uh, Europe or with China, with tariffs on, on Chinese experts, of course, and uh, with some strict measures on Europeans as well, because uh, he also talks not necessarily about free trade, which is probably co close to his personal heart, but about fair trade, which is closer to today's uh, tendencies in Democratic Party. So we have to pl probably take into account the um, aspect that, you know, Joe Biden being elected as president does not mean that U.S. comes back to normal, whatever that means for some of us or some of the other observers, but that there are some trends that Trump really emphasized, that Trump made worse in some cases, but uh, rather they were still there even before Trump was ever a politician. So we have to probably take that into account, being Europeans, and, and think about uh, means and ways of ensuring that uh, this relationship between Europe and the US has a long-term future. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I see that uh, we already have our first uh, questions now from the audience, and I wanted to uh, tie in a few of them because they really align neatly with some of the things that have already been said. First and foremost, many greetings from all over the world. I can see people are joining from Norway, from Italy, all the way from Little Rock, Arkansas. Fantastic place. So uh, I will uh, field the question from Andrea Magliani, who asked the following, what, uh, what can we expect to happen in case that President Trump does not accept the results of the election. I guess uh, he means that when when he, he loses. Can you envisage a few few uh, scenarios? Whoever wants to take a crack at that. Well, if no one's taking, then I can can say a couple of words. Well, hopefully that's not going to happen. Of course. He was ambivalent on this matter before. He said a couple of times that uh, he would not be willing to leave the office. And on some other instances, he was more willing to say that if the results are counted fairly, whatever that means in his world, then he, he leaves the office. But I, I really trust the US institutions. Uh, they are capable of ensuring that on January 20th, we have a new president if Joe Biden is elected or uh, the second inauguration of Donald Trump if he is re-elected. Uh, so um, in that case, the system, I think, will, will work out. Besides that, I think we also have to take note of the polling. And I know that a lot of people are, are skeptical about the polling after 2016, with uh, margins of error being a bit bigger at that time than expected. Uh, but in this case, we see in the polling that shows Joe Biden being in the lead uh, with a substantial margin. And if that's the case, and if the margin of, of the election victory of a uh, Democratic candidate, which is certainly not a given and many things can, can still happen, um, then in, in this case, I think Trump will not have a strong argument to make, even if he emphasizes some examples, real or imagined ones of, of uh, some mistakes or errors in, in the election process. So if the margin is, is big enough, I think there is no, no fear of, of this happening. And even if it's small, then I hope that the institutions and the legal practices and a lot of people that work on the elections in the US will ensure that they go, go more or less smoothly I mean the transition period. Sebastian, you wanna come in on that? Yeah, mostly, mostly just to second what Linus just said. Um, I think, what we've seen in the past uh, with, with Donald Trump is a pattern of um, theatrical conflict um, and a shying away from actual conflict. Um, and that doesn't mean that um, there aren't certain, certain dangers here. I mean, even the theatrics of, of conflict can get out of hand and can, can turn into real conflict, real violence, et cetera. Um, but I also find it difficult to imagine a scenario where the uh, what the result of the election is uh, is fairly clear, and there's a refusal um, to heed those results. Um, I think I think if the results are 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 more blurry, um, things are going to get a little more tricky. Um, yeah. 
since we just heard the theatrics of conflict, Duny, any any thoughts on that, perhaps, also? Um, I think that the Trump administration openly declares uh, all the time that its ultimate goal is to rebalance all the America's trade relationships in order to make them uh, serve the U.S. interests and so on. But where does the world really stand in that? I mean, even if he said that he's keeping Korea from any nuclear attacks, he's keeping the world, he's like, uh, he's the father to the, to America. Uh, I mean, if he loses against um, uh, Joe Biden, uh, maybe some filthy things are going to, to happen. We don't, we're not sure, uh, but hopefully nothing would. Uh, and yeah, I think we'll all, uh, can't, we cannot really wait um, to see the presidential inauguration and see what would happen. Wonderful. Th thank you so much. I'll, I'll, I'll just package another question into this right away because we have someone from Granada, Lola Ferre, who asks, uh, do you think that the U.S. election results now will make a significant or will have a significant impact on the European far right movements? Because that already came up in, I think, two or three of your uh, initial uh, responses. So any thoughts on potential results of the, uh, of the elections on the far right uh, in and across Europe? I mean, this is, of course, all guesswork and, and sort of punditry right now. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant, but I think it's it's fairly obvious that a Trump victory um, would certainly bolster far right nationalist movements in Europe. Um, on the other hand, I think that a loss would do less um, to counter these movements than we would hope or than we would think, I'm afraid. If I, Steve, was to uh, comment on that, and of course, uh, European far-right politics is also not my specialty, so this would be as a, as a European observer. Um, I think uh, a lot of those far-right or, or uh, extreme, or that not necessarily extremely populist groups, but very populist types of, of parties on the right side of politics ha has, of course, in the last uh, a few years uh, seen inspiration and I think in a lot of kind of framing of issues and types of uh, justifications of arguments that have been playing around in Europe uh, for a long time. Uh, but I, I think um, whether Trump loses or wins, I think we also need to, as we have been talking about, remind ourselves uh, that uh, the, the, the kind of um, emotions or dynamics that made Trump president are not necessarily going to go away. Those types of sentiments, uh, whether we talk about Europe or the US are also not necessarily going to go away. And it's not because of uh, neither China or the US or other types of external actors that those far right types of movements in Europe has grown and keeps growing in, in many countries. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be a huge effect of the U.S. election. And I also think there's going to be a lot of mobilization on the far right side of U.S. politics. Should Trump lose and should you see other types of figures or depending on how Trump is treated in the U.S. after a possible defeat, uh, who will kind of mobilize around him and make sure that those types of very popular sentiments among um, many groups in the US and many groups in the, uh, Europe will keep evolving and sadly, I think, not uh, disappear or not even slow down, but possibly just grow stronger as that type seems to be the kind of populist wave that uh, a lot of the world is going through politically. So the way I get this there, is, you know, even if he loses, there is still some, uh, a lot of groundwork to be done. Yes, Dunia. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, one of the uh, one of the aspects that can exemplify the whole U.S.-Europe uh, relationship is the fact that Trump bashed the NATO. Um, it really had effects on the transatlantic aliens. Um, not only did he call the aliens with NATO, that it, it was absolute, but even during that, it was, he said that uh, it was not really enough to fight terrorism. And even if he uh, reversed his opinion about that, but you know, that aliens is really important 
it was really uh, important. And I think Trump always makes sure to stress that the European a uh, allies have not fulfilled the financial obligation to the US. Um, he always says that, don't forget, we're in competition with China and many other countries, including Europe. So I don't think uh, they're not really in good terms and I don't think they'll ever be in good terms, um, especially when it comes to, to economy. I mean, he really emphasized on that uh, because the economy frame for him is one of the frames that he uses the most, uh, talking about wealth, industry, trade, taxes, employment, infrastructure. It's all about economy. Um, so he just want, you know, he is also making sure that when he talks about that, everyone knows exactly what kind of values he's referring to. And that is America, a great again, America first. So I think even if he reaffirmed the U.S. commitment to Europe and the fact that he said, you know, a strong and the free Europe is, is a vital importance to the United States. But it's not it's always related to the U.S. So one, I think I can conclude from that, that it has become urgent for Europe to diminish its security reliance on the U.S., uh, maybe by strengthening its own defense capabilities. Uh, but I'm not really sure that can happen. But it is in the U.S. interest to support the, the EU, but I don't know if that would ever happen again. Um, so, yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you. I think you opened up uh, one or two uh, points there that uh, once again tie straight into uh, uh, two new questions that I just got in the chat. So uh, the first one actually uh, uh, focusing specifically on, on uh, security issues and as we go forward in this uh, EU-US relations. So the question is from Fernando Galen. Uh, and he asks, uh, what are the applications of the, uh, the, these elections in the future of the EU US relations in issues such as ongoing issues, such as, for instance, the data privacy, uh, uh, in data privacy, so privacy shield, the taxation of US companies in the EU also, but I think the main, uh, the main focus in that question is uh, uh, data privacy. Any, any takers? I can just start briefly, probably. I think, first of all, the U.S. has to make a domestic political decision on, on some of these matters. And it's not probably a coincidence that we have Twitter and uh, other CEOs uh, this week uh, uh, in Congress talking about this issue and the politicians discussing whether uh, these companies should be regarded more as, as media companies rather than just platforms to share thoughts and opinions. And then this uh, internal regulation could have a lot of impact, obviously, on matters of international uh, relations. But in terms of, um, of the situation currently, I think it's pretty clear that there are many European countries, uh, including, first of all, France, who would like to tax those big companies more than they pay at the moment, especially in, in Europe. So this kind of taxation based on your registration country should end with multinational companies uh, working on, on, on a global scale. Uh, but whether that's a workable solution uh, with the US obviously being in a, in a situation where it deems its responsibility to defend uh, uh, its, uh, its companies, it's a debatable issue. And of course, if we agree on taxation, then we can probably talk more on whether there could be some more compatibility compatibility on on data privacy on the, on data issues as well, uh, because I think the, the the first decisions are not yet made and it's still a, a very ambivalent policy area. Hans, go ahead. Yeah, and it's uh, again. I think uh, from my perspective, I see that the issue of whether we discuss e-commerce negotiations in the WTO or more specific uh, reaction towards major US-based platforms or digital companies. Um, it's again, from the perspective, I think that uh, we have three big players in this game. And I think uh, the EU and, and some European countries are probably the most forward heading when it comes to uh, many of these issues. And then you have, of course, the, the big companies in the world that are, are US and as Lina said, uh, the U.S. has to come to terms, I think, with both, uh, um, which we now see in the U.S. election also for the first time that you see a very, at least in, in parts of the early debates amongst Democrats, a very um, vital debate amongst those candidates, how to deal with this huge 
uh, monopolistic types of, of platforms that has gotten so big that they um, uh, just are very, very, very influential and has up to now been incredibly uh, ignorant towards a lot of those security or privacy types of issues also when it comes to uh, interference and how to influence uh, elections and people. And of course, on the opposite side of that is, is China that has a very strong uh, political type of control mechanism from the outset because it's a very authoritarian country, but where you also have uh, talking to uh, Chinese tech experts or, or kind of tech sector leaders, also a total shock and disregard for both, I think, the European, but partic particularly uh, US uh, politics or even what they refer to as nativity when it comes to the influence and the kind of lack of control whatsoever about whether uh, it's content and the taxation of, of content that are used by these companies or their ability to share or sell or, or make use of, of personal data in extremely uh, uh, privacy kind of invading uh, base. Uh, so I think in this area is an area where actually Europe has a lot of potential to claim leadership and, and, and take action because it's a big market where these companies want to be. But of course, uh, it's not only the US that has come to terms with its own uh, decisions on this, but of course the EU has come to come to terms on how to bring and coordinate amongst all the EU members who are not always so willing to uh, act uh, as one, but uh, also like to play around with their different domestic uh, takes on this. Uh, which is something that really fits nicely also into our everyday life worlds now as we, you know, zoom across different platforms and then we're allowed to use certain platforms but not others, particularly, you know, when we communicate across uh, uh, countries, uh, even within Europe. I've got another uh, question coming up uh, from uh, Roberta Meyerhofer, who's, uh, I'm always happy that she's the director of the Center for Inter-American Studies, so essentially my boss. She's, I'm always happy when she calls me out on something that I did very early on uh, during my uh, opening, why bracket out COVID-19? So, of course, that's the elephant in the room. So isn't uh, the ongoing pandemic, of course, a decisive, that is the question, uh, Roberta, isn't uh, the ongoing um, pandemic a decisive factor in the presidential race? Yes, no, maybe. What's the impact there? It's obviously a major factor in the race. I think even for a literary and cultural studies person, I can for once give a definitive answer and not say, well, it depends, but it definitely is a major influence in the race. I think it's also a major influence in, in the development of uh, views on the role of America and on, on China. And I think it, it has a huge impact on <sighs> on both countries, um, forms of outreach, um, their public diplomacy efforts, et cetera. Um, and of course, this is something at least regarding China, but maybe also the US that Hans will be able to say more about. Um, but I think it, it might be an even bigger factor or it might end up being an even bigger factor in at least temporarily shifting views of the US and of internationalism um, than the Trump presidency is. Other thoughts on the pandemic and its likely impact on, on the elections? Linus? Uh, yeah, sure. I think uh, Trump had the much better chance as well as, as polling uh, before the pandemic struck the country. And uh, it's a much more complicated situation. And, and I just like uh, liked yesterday's, uh, I think, or just this week's article in, in Financial Times uh, uh, by Janan Ganesh. And he basically discussed whether the things like the pandemic uh, makes people in various countries, those who elect their leaders, think that competence really matters more than before. And uh, maybe these uh, elections in the US and in many other countries that are taking place this year or next year will prove that to be a viable argument. Uh, so it, it's interesting to see whether that has a global impact or whether each country just takes into account its own situation and its own interpretation of whether the leaders were 
capable of changing the policies and the reactions for the better or, or not. Because in some countries, for instance, in Italy, we see that the government is so popular uh, that it's it's really strange to see that uh, Italians love their their leaders. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, other thoughts on that, perhaps, Hans? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think uh, it's uh, the pandemic. I think it it's uh, I think it's hard to point to any other part of the world where you have had such a disastrous response with the available measures and the available, I mean, uh, capacity that the US could have had taken, uh, it's, I would call it a disaster, uh, the way that has been handled. And of course, uh, <laughs> that China has a lot of public relations work it has to do in terms of how it dealt with the early, early days of when the uh, virus be became known. And of course, it, it will be able to look back at, uh, at as the country, as of all protection today, that, uh, that is the country by far and above any other that is back to normal when it comes to how society now functions and how production change are back up and running and, and how it's uh, kind of um, domestic uh, institutions start functioning again. Of course, if there was a new pandemic to break up or new transmission of, of the virus, that, that could change uh, very easily. Uh, but I think we also, again, I, I kind of caution to remind ourselves that we, uh, not in this debate, but I think amongst our, a lot of our political leaders and kind of uh, friends and colleagues out there are waiting for kind of Trump to, to step away. Uh, but uh, again, uh, Trump might very possibly lose, but there's still a very large segment amongst what I would call very extreme days that are still willing and cheering on for Trump to continue. And that also includes uh, uh, quite a few of my very close American friends who are not very extremist or have uh, very kind of radical political views, uh, but they are fed up with certain, uh, the certain ways that American politics have functioned and how their lives have developed over the last few decades and are not really wanting to go back to uh, the ways that things were either five or, or 10 years uh, ago, even amongst uh, a disastrous types of uh, measures that have been taken during this uh, pandemic. Dunia. Yeah, um, I totally agree with Hans. Um, the pandemic is going to be decisive uh, aspect. I'm just going to give like a brief answer. Uh, from a discourse uh, analytic uh, perspective and going through the second debate when they talked about the pandemic, uh, it was actually the first uh, topic that was posed. And I think that means that it is important and it is decisive for both parties. And I think that, you know, if you go to, if you uh, uh, focus on what Trump said, he, was, he made it more personal since he was uh, infected by the, uh, by the disease. He really used an in-group language, which was really smart of him. While Joe Biden tried to just, you know, use the U and try to make himself as the representative of the nation, which is also good. And I think the importance of the uh, of the pandemic um, lies in the fact that it it did is related to uh, foreign policies and international relations with Europe and with China, especially. And I think that the future of transatlantic relations has never been more uh, uncertain than the Trump era. And uh, 2020 will be a decisive year for both sides, I believe. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for your insightful thoughts there. I've got two more questions. I'm also monitoring time at the same uh, at the same time. So uh, I think we'll uh, we have time to ask at least two more questions. Uh, perhaps if you. Uh, bear with me there. Uh, I do have a question from David uh, Kuada from uh, Lithuania, actually. So probably one of uh, uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Linus, perhaps. Uh, so Trump has suggested that the so we're harking back a little bit on uh, to what we uh, briefly discussed earlier with regards to. Uh, a contested election potentially. So Trump suggested that the election results might be fraudulent. Uh, what kind of precedent uh, does this represent uh, to American politics or democracy in general? So again, question is about the danger perhaps of calling into question uh, the, uh, the election results. 
Well, yeah, I can maybe say a couple of words. Thanks, David, for your question. Uh, well, I think uh, as we've discussed before, the hope is that this this is only talk and no action will be taken. Trump likes this all talk, no action. And usually that happens with his arguments as well. So in, in this case, during the four years, we've had so many interesting uh, ideas uh, stated publicly by very high ranking US officials from Trump administration or the president himself, that it's difficult to even think of uh, any aspect that was not changed in terms of how US po political uh, system functions. And we even haven't talked about, for instance, the fact that Trump was impeached because it doesn't, it doesn't seem relevant today, even though it's, it's a huge thing. And of course, in any other circumstances, we would focus on, on this particular uh, aspect of, of Trump's first uh, term as, as a crucial one. But it's not, not, it's not relevant. There are so many other things that have happened. So in this case, I would um, think and, and hope that uh, uh, all this talk is used to mobilize his own uh, voters. Uh, in, in order to show that he is not really keen to be a loser, whatever the result com uh, comes in in the end, but uh, that will not change the situation on the ground. If he loses, he will leave the White House. If he wins, and that's uh, a result that is officially confirmed, then he is he is the winner. And basically, his talk will will probably not have an impact on on that. Other thoughts, perhaps? I mean, since we, we do know that language shapes reality and how we perceive it, I thought, like, Dunya, you might want to come in on that in particular. Um, I think here we can just put, like, some kind of dichotomy, because on the one hand, uh, there is white exposure to racial ethnic diversity predicts greater threat and white identification, uh, both of which are associated with greatest support for Trump. And on the other hand, um, racially and ethnically diverse contexts afford white people with opportunities for inner group contact, um, which is associated with less threat, weaker and white identification and less support for Trump. So um, Trump's administration represents rather a radical departure from how civic nationalism and US leadership in the liberal world order, if we are to, to call it. So we are to, to witness, um, I would say, clash of civilization, I suppose. And it is going to be uh, it is going to be really interesting um, to see what would happen because we cannot really um, predict or foresee whatever is going to happen. But we cannot really see uh, we cannot really wait uh, to see what what's going to uh, happen. I guess. Thank you so much for that because that uh, ties into the next question because we're kind of already talking about predictions, predicting scenarios, or at least of, of uh, conducting thought experiments. And I've got one more question that I'll probably use to tie us into some sort of wrap up ultimately. Uh, so uh, Eloy Lopez Bolivar from Granada writes, uh, or has a question about a, a potential uh, victory by Joe Biden. So Joe Biden's victory, would that uh, his re victory represent a success for the free market economy for the international community or not, I guess, is part of that question. So. Well, I can start then. Uh, well, I think it's difficult to put it uh, as an either or question. If Trump wins, it's, it's the one tendency. If, if Biden wins, it's, it's the other. I think there are so many factors that have to be taken into account. There are, there are so many different motivations why people vote for, for Trump and, uh, and Biden. So we should be probably careful in making generalizations, which will be out there in any case, in, in the media and by pundits, uh, and they, they're going to be all over the place. Now, in terms of, of what we've discussed before, I think we should focus on the US uh, as a whole, more institutions than only the president. We should look at the tendencies that go beyond uh, Trump's statements and Trump's presidency, because that's the focus of everyone. Uh, but again, again, security, US involvement and in international relations, US. Um, expectations out of international institutions, U.S. understanding of what role it should uh, take in different regions, that's changing besides Trump. And we should look at things that, uh, again, go beyond his, his four years. Uh, of course, Biden would probably be much softer on many things that Trump did. He would 
be closely aligned with Europeans uh, on climate change. She would be closely aligned with Europeans on uh, many other threats uh, in terms of geopolitics. But does that mean we would see a substantial progress in European-US relationship, for instance, on trade? Could there be another comprehensive trade agreement? Or not another, but the first one trade agreement? It's doubtful because Democratic Party, as we talked before, has some groups, uh, some in influential politicians who are rather skeptical on, on free trade, and they would be closely aligned on that with Trump with regards to international institutions. We've seen that even Paris Climate Change Agreement or uh, Iran nuclear agreement was made as an executive agreement by Barack Obama because he could not gather enough support to make it a treaty that would be ratified in the Senate, which means that basically we see those short-term decisions or decisions that can be rather easily reversed being uh, a normal thing in U.S. politics for a, for a decade or even more. Uh, and that enables us to predict that uh, uh, even Biden's presidency would have a lot of unpredictable patterns uh, with regards to uh, U.S. Uh, as, as a global player. And, and that, that's probably the situation that we have to, uh, to face in, in the future. Thank you, Linus. Sebastian, perhaps. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's also important, um, as Hans has been also doing a couple of times now, to, um, to keep in mind that we're also talking about uh, larger uh, social uh, discursive trends here. And I think part of the, part of the challenges um, to the international order as we know it and as we've gotten to know it during the euro crisis um, in, in the form of austerity measures, etc. This particular brand of international uh, liberalism is, is being reconsidered on a much broader scale and with much more vigor um, than just in, in the context of the Trump presidency. It's being challenged both from right and from left populist movements. Um, but it's also being being reconsidered in other um, more institutionally centrist areas, and and so I think that would definitely factor into into even a Biden presidency and its relationship to to these international institutions. Um, I also think it ties into our question before that about a potential the role that that Donald Trump would play in in the case of a of a loss. Um, one of the things we've seen um, over the over the last couple of years is an increasing economy of political sentiment, a monetization of political sentiment on social media platforms, um, in the form of certain radio shows, um, etc. A, a lot of people seem to be speculating um, that Trump might be active in this area if he if he has to leave the White House, stay around as a political influencer in a way. Um, and he certainly has the following to monetize monetize that role. Um, and I think from from basically from the sidelines, he could also still continue to have an impact, as could the the kind of public sentiment that he's been tapping into. Thank you, Sebastian. Hans, any thoughts on that or any out outlook or expectations perhaps? Yeah, it's, uh, I guess that's the most exciting type of question, what will happen next, right? And I think a few things we, we do know that uh, let's assume, because the question is whether Biden wins, right? And what happens should he win? Uh, uh, Trump is a radical in many ways, but a very populist type of, of figure on the right side of US politics on many issues, not necessarily all issues, but, but many issues. While uh, Biden has been come across as a very moderate type of um, politician, uh, but in also a pretty uh, kind of mobilized when it comes to uh, more um, diverse positions also within his party and within the U.S. population. So it's not going to be easy uh, for him to kind of promote the type of capitalist or free market types of politics that we have uh, seen grow in the U.S. over the last few decades. 
moving forward because there's also a lot of expectations for him to to act on those more types of welfare issues or inequality issues or racial divisions issues or types of like deep rooted very very hard uh, challenges in in U.S. politics. So I think there's going to be also a lot of um, uh, potential outcomes of this election that we don't know yet, depending on how the, the chips fall. And when it comes to the US-Europe uh, relations, uh, which uh, both uh, Sebastian and Linus has all been talking to, I think it's also short-sighted to assume a kind of sudden return to some type of normalcy as we use it, use, knew it before, because there are types of divided interests that are not necessarily as closely aligned as they used to be uh, a decade or two ago. So I think there still will be a lot of uncertainty towards both how long lasting Biden's positions will be and how much he will actually return the US back to uh, what we knew during the Obama years and the Bush years and the Clinton uh, years. And then when it comes to that uh, kind of Asia and the China uh, position, I think it's it's an expectancy that with Biden, we will definitely see uh, a return to some moderation on a lot of, of many of these very conflictual issues, but we will expect a continuing conflictual line when it comes to some of those trade and competitive technology security issues uh, that are not going to go away. And we also expect to see that a, a kind of more multilateral climate friendly uh, development oriented, wanting to promote the US leadership in the world, human rights types of issues where Biden is supposed to, um, to uh, champion more closely with allies also will uh, challenge not only China, but also uh, countries around China in ways that has not been challenged in the last uh, few years with uh, Trump, where for instance, that uh, Clinton presidency would have been much more challenging on, on other uh, issues. Thank you, Hans. Dunya, a couple of final thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that uh, the 2020 presidential election will show if the uh, Trump effect in terms of anti-liberal and protectionist policy making is a passive phenomenon or a deeper transformative trend in US politics. We are to see that. Um, and as Dina said, maybe we will see how um, Biden, if he happens to win, how he's going to um, to uh, handle everything, the climate change and everything. And another example is the UK's exit from the union on January and how that could lead deepening of the cooperation among the EU member states and how would that really affect um, the, uh, the US in general. So I think if Biden happens to win, then maybe we'll witness a new America. Uh, I mean, even if uh, during the, uh, the debate, he, uh, his ideas are really insightful vis-a-vis -vis immigration and the fact that he said, well, we care about mothers, children, and so on, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pandemic and healthcare and the fact that he wanted to create what he called Biden's care instead of Obama's care. Um, even uh, when, it, when it comes to race, uh, even with the whole uh, history and the fact that he signed the crime bill in 1994, uh, maybe uh, he, uh, he came around and I think that we'll witness a new era, a new America. And, and I think we'll just have to keep our fingers crossed for that. Thank you. Thank you also for such a, a hopeful outlook. I think uh, uh, what all of you made pretty clear is regardless of what the outcome is, even though you know current polls uh, 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 show a certain trend is that uh, engagement with the United States is uh, necessary. It's unavoidable, whether we like it or not, right? Whether I think I'm back. Is everybody okay? Sorry. See, we we managed uh, we managed to get through this entire session without one hiccup, and now toward the end. Uh, 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 it struck. So uh, I was just telling you about how you can find out a little bit more about the Arcus Alliance. So please do visit uh, arcus-alliance.eu. You'll find a bunch of material there. A recording of this debate will also be made available on the Arcus YouTube channel. So for anybody who tuned in perhaps a little bit later, you can rewatch uh, the debate. I would also li uh, like to announce already the third academic debate of the Arcus Network, which will take place uh, on Wednesday, December 2nd at 6 p.m. Central European 
time. And uh, it will be once again, a completely different topic, but also a very exciting topic. The uh, a working title for that debate is energy as a pillar driver and goal of today's world. And uh, perhaps uh, the speakers on that panel uh, can already tie in some of the results of the presidential elections, because particularly with regards to climate change and other energy concerns uh, uh, that might already be pertinent there. Okay, so uh, please do join us for the next debate as well. And uh, once again, a virtual round of applause to our four speakers. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks also being so, so, so patient and so, uh, such great uh, conversation partners. No one was hogging the limelight. So once again, thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you also, uh, everybody online and good night and stay safe.